Hey, glad you're here. I'm, I'm Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. Uh, welcome if you're brand new to Hope. We're, we're glad, to, glad to have you here. Those of you up in the balcony back there, I am watching when you start making out. I see that. I'm in the room. Okay. Now, <laughs> they're like, shoot. Uh, look at you move closer. That was awkward. Um, <laughs> Hey, this is, this is the service, third service is an opportunity for you to ask questions. We'll take them live. We'll take live questions, uh, kind of right towards the end of the message. So if you have something you want to ask about today's message or anything that's kind of in the context of what we're talking about, we'll give a little bit of latitude, but not a ton. We don't want to kind of go on, on everything. But, but if you want to ask a question about today's message, you can go, you can go right ahead. I wanted to say one other thing about... Um, uh, about this week, some of you knew I threw a Facebook post up there. I've been kind of busy, crazy. Last week, so not this week, but the previous week, on Thursday, I believe it was a Thursday, might have been Wednesday, I can't remember, Wednesday or Thursday morning, I got a phone call from my mom, and she's, uh, she's 74, and she called and said for about three weeks she's experiencing chest pain radiating down her arms. I'm no doctor, <laughs> but I know that's not good, okay, and so... She had just gotten back from the doctor, and they had given her a stress test, and she said that they, she had some blockage, some heart disease, and so she was going to go in for what's called an angioplasty, where they put a little balloon in there, and they blow it up. That's probably a bad way to say it, but you know, they, they make the artery better and all that, bigger and all that. So I said, Mom, I'll take you. So I took off Monday night, went up there, went down. We took her from Hibbing, uh, small town hospital, wanted to get her in a bigger hospital setting, so we went to Hib, uh, Duluth up there, St. Luke's, great hospital, treated really great. As I brought her there, uh, on the way there, she says, I'm not, I'm not really not feeling well. She starts getting peak in color and all that kind of deal, and so uh, we go through the pre-checkup and all that, and she's getting a little more peaked. Uh, I get her into the, it's called the cath lab. I don't even know what that stands for. Medical people, you could probably, catheter lab. Uh, it, uh, but, <laughs> you're a dentist, I know, but that, yeah, it works. Uh, there was nothing wrong with her teeth. They were fine. But they, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and she's kind of normal. I'm talking to other people, and I, I push her away. You know, she's, they have to have her in a wheelchair. She didn't need that, but she's, she's going away. And I, little did I know, at that moment, she's having a heart attack in the hospital at that moment. And so it's like, whoa, okay. So I go down to the waiting area and the whole thing, and she gets done with the procedure and all that, and they, they bring her into her, her recovery room, and they said, the, the nurse kept going on and on about, I, I can't even tell you how good it is that you were here. You were moments away from a major coronary. And so God, in his mercy, uh, <laughs> allowed my mother and I to be there at the very moment when she was having this. In fact, when they did this echocardia, I know, there's medical people here going, ha, ha, you know what you're talking about. I realize that. But some echo deal where they, like an ultrasound for the heart, they said there was no damage. So she it was amazing. At the same time, it's a big deal to get all this done and kind of go through that. So that's kind of her been her Mother's Day week. You know, that's what I wrote on her card. Like, I'm really glad everything is going well. But that was kind of her Mother's Day week. I grew up, I'm an only child. My mom is a diabetic. Back in the day, she uh, got diabetes when she was 24. For 50 years now, she's had diabetes. In fact, I'm somewhat of a medical miracle in the fact that uh, with my mom's type of diabetes, generally you aren't able to have children. They, they, they don't make it. In fact, I have a brother and a sister who I've never met who went full term, but then were, were what we called then, I don't mean to disrespect, but it, they call them blue babies or they were stillborn babies. And so I have a brother and sister I've never met. Look forward to meeting them someday. It'll be kick. It's like, oh, how you doing? I'm your brother. I'm your sister. It's crazy. But um, and I don't know how that works. I don't think for all eternity they're a baby. I don't think that works that way, but I don't, I don't, that'd be kind of weird actually. But... Um, but anyway, Mother's Day in our household um, was, was a good thing. We always celebrate it as a, as a positive experience. At the same time, I know firsthand that for maybe some of you in the room, Mother's Day is a hard deal. Mother's Day is a hard deal, and, and it was in some case in, in, our, in our case as well because of all this. And I know maybe some of you have lost children or uh, maybe infertility issues, or maybe you just lost your mom. I know that that's really hard as well. And so I just want to know that this day comes as a, Mixed blessing, right? We, we celebrate Happy Mom's Day. You know, we, we want that. But I fully realize, having just gone through this uh, with my mom, that there's some, there's some issues as well. So I, I'm, I'm very aware of those, what's going on for the room 
and some of the difficulties. And so I just know this week I've been praying for you on that, and uh, we'll continue to do so. We are um, looking at something today that is really fun. I would say that, but I, I just, I do think it's fun. And there is something about love. When you love another person, I don't know why it is exactly. I've been pondering it all week that the people that you love the most, you tend to hurt, right? You know, why is it? This is the question I've been pondering, and I haven't really come up with a, a perfect answer yet. I think I have somewhat of an answer, but why is it that the people that you love the most are the ones that you hurt? This is stupid, because don't you understand that you live in that relational circle? We should go out and hurt complete strangers, because I don't have to live with the drama of that, right? I should just go out there and do that. But instead, it's the people that I'm close to, related to, my family, my wife, my kids, those people and people here at church that I'm really close with, those people that I deeply love, sometimes we're just complete idiots with, right? And that's, that's, it's fascinating how that, the relational conflict or when you get inside of a relationship, how the potential that it can really do damage, can really hurt, exists. There were some great theologians in the 1970s. They formed, a, they were philosophers and theologians. They formed a rock group called Nazareth. I'm kind of kidding on the theologian thing here. But they had this, they had this great wise counsel about this issue And I quote, love hurts, love scars, love wounds, and mars, and, I'm going to stop that now, um, I, that's hard to do for three services, I have not as much voice as I had this morning, that, and mars part, I just couldn't get, anyway, I just want to read the rest of this. This is what it says. Any, uh, any heart not tough or strong enough to take a lot of pain, take a lot of pain. Love is like a cloud, holds a lot of rain. Love hurts. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> love hurts. And you know the song, right? You know, the very famous 70s song. It does. If you're involved in relationships, if you've decided to get yourself into a relationship, living in a fallen world, I know two things. For sure, you are created by God to have perfect relationships. And second thing is, you have none of those, except one half of a perfect relationship from God. His is right to you, yours back, not so much. Okay? That's it. Your design, though, by God, in the Garden of Eden is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Perfect relationship. You're designed for that. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. We live somewhere else. So what happens then is you get into relationships, and there's issues. There's barbs. There's conflict. It happens. Some of you are brand new to the church. I, I know that about 7% of you, according to our survey, almost 7 plus or close to 8, or I can't remember exactly the percentage. This is your first ever church experience, Hope Community. And you come in here and you think, you know what, my friends out there, they're really difficult. My coworkers, they, my family, it was very difficult. I'll come into the church and it'll be safe here. Now let me encourage you with something. Christ makes a huge difference. He makes a huge difference in our relationships. But if you're under the impression that if you come here and it's going to be completely safe, you're this is actually this place is the most dangerous place why because here you come and you get vulnerable here you come and you tell people things that are really deep on your heart and somebody might just trample on that it i'm not i'm not just saying this possibly will happen i'm promising you if you stay at hope community church long enough and you really get to know people they will hurt you they will disappoint you i know i've done it I've done it sometimes in messages, uh, not meaning to. I've done it in personal, uh, inter- interpersonal uh, relationships. They've done it to me. But you work it through. But it's conflict. That's what we're going to look at tonight. I love the fact that this beautiful story in Song of Solomon, where everything is fairy tale, it's beautiful. Everything works out. We'll look at that in just a second to see how everything has kind of worked out. They include a section where they both act like three-year-olds. 
And they're both completely selfish. They're both completely motivated on their own uh, desires. And the thing goes south. I love that it's in here. I love that about the Bible. It's so raw and true. And that's what you're going to see in the midst of this beautiful story of a man and a woman, Solomon and his bride, who come together. This beautiful story. So if you've got a Bible with you, or you can look on that insert, open it up to uh, um, chapter 5 of Song of Solomon. We're going to be in chapter 5, cover the whole chapter from verse 2 all the way to 16. Um, while you're going there, let me just kind of give you a, b- a bit of a recap of how the emotional roller coaster, how we've ridden this emotional roller coaster through the book, okay? So it starts out, the very beginning of the book, the, the second verse in the book, is about her infatuation with this guy who she sees. She doesn't even know him yet. That's the way it, the passage leads us to believe. She doesn't even know him, but she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of my mouth. Uh, chapter 1, verse 2. And this leads to, in, in uh, verse uh, let me make sure I got my, I got my chicken notes here. Three, where she says that I am afraid that all the maidens like you. And I'm not sure you'll pay attention to me. So there's fear. So she's got these feelings. She's also got self-consciousness. In verse five, if you remember that passage that I've told everybody in the room, but especially people who wrestle with, oh, with self-image, it says in a beautiful passage, you should memorize, dark am I yet lovely, Okay. And what that means, and she goes on to describe what it's talking about, what this dark skin that she has, not that there's anything wrong with dark skin. In our culture, actually, we, we, we look forward to dark skin. We look forward to a tan or someone who, maybe ethnically, you're dark skinned, and that's a positive thing. This is not an ethnic thing. She's dark skinned because she's a laborer, and, and you would look down on her. Her hands are calloused because she's had to work in the, in the vineyards. We'll see that in just a second when we look to the next one. That's what is her imperfection. Not, it has nothing to do with her ethnicity or her race. It has to do with her position in life, her socioeconomic status, which was very low. She was a peasant. And she says, dark am I yet lovely. Don't stare at me because I'm dark. Okay? So don't get, don't, don't misplay, don't misunderstand uh, that. Uh, that. That's not saying that the skin in and of itself is a bad thing. Skin color is just skin color. This is implying more than skin color. It's implying her family background, who she was, and she's very self-conscious about it. And if every one of us is just realistic for just a minute, we're self-conscious about something about our physical appearance. You just just are. They've interviewed supermodels and said, what do you think of your body? And they'll list 10 things that are just, I hate my body. It's like, really? Okay? Everybody's self-conscious about this, and, and she was too. So she has this uncertainty, this self-consciousness. This, the reason for her darkness was because she was forced to work out in the vineyards and she was mistreated by her brothers. My my mother's sons, another way of saying my brothers, were angry with me and they forced me, it says in verse 6, chapter 1, they forced me to work in the vineyards. And so she was a, a laborer. She had to work hard, but she was mistreated. She wasn't treated the way she should have been. She was forced to do this by her family. And then, if you look in the, in the rest of chapter 1 there, she takes this huge risk. She's talking to this, this the, in the song. It's a song, so it's all poetry. You kind of got to work it out. But in the song, it talks about, uh, what should I do about this? Do you think I'm crazy? She's asking these bunch of women called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And they tell her, go and and basically park yourself by the tents of the shepherds. Metaphorically saying, go around him, hang out by him, take a chance. You see all that emotion there? Now the beautiful thing, so far in the book, all the way through chapter 4, is everything works out perfect. So you can see the next column there, you got all these other things, but then you've got, how does it, how does her infatuation work? Well, it comes back, where she's now feeling, uh, she's now has a satisfaction of love. In chapter 2, verse 4, she says, his banner over me is love. In other words, this banner idea, a military banner like you'd carry in a, in, in a war, over her marks her with love. So that infatuation turns into love. Her fear ends up being trust because she says in two, uh, 2.16, she says, what she say again? Oh yeah. She says, my, my, uh, uh, my lover is mine and I am his. She has this sense of there's, a, there's no one else is going to be with him. I'm with him. And a trust 
one another. This goes from self-consciousness where she says, not only am I dark and yet lovely because I'm uh, my, eth- my, not my ethnicity, but my uh, socioeconomic status. She says, I'm also just kind of common looking. She makes that. I'm common. She says, I'm just one of the lilies. To which he replies, if you remember, in chapter 2, verse 2, great line, great line. He says, you might be just a lily, but baby, yeah, I, I inserted the baby, uh, but baby, everybody else is like a thorn. You're like a lily among thorns to me. Oh, let me just tell you, that'll preach, guys. Write that down. Lily among thorns. That'll go. Work that one now. So, and, he's, and he uses her own poetry back at her. You're like, he says, you're like a lily among thorns. She's like, oh, you're kidding me. I'm common. He says, not to me, you're not. You're not common to me. You're like a mare. Remember that where he looked at that? You're like a mare that's just totally distracting me among the stallions. This mistreatment that was happening is followed up by in chapter uh, 3, verse 7, uh, with a protection. If you remember in chapter 3, there's this big processional happening. And we're not sure exactly if he's going out to get her or if they're coming back or how it all works. But somehow there's this carriage, and we'll take a look at this in a minute as well. There's a carriage and there's 60 warriors around it. That implies huge amount of you're safe with me. No one's going to mistreat you around me as long as I'm around. Okay? That leads from this risk that she took to the ultimate reward of giving herself fully to this relationship. If you look in chapter 4, verse 16, the wedding night last, last week, we talked about biblical, passionate lovemaking, the way it's supposed to be, letting the dog off the hook on the wedding night, the way it's supposed to be. Very beautiful passage, uh, chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. It says, that she finally says, awake, awake, north wind. In other words, what she's implying, and the other times in this song she said, um, do not awaken or arouse love before it's time. Do not awaken or arouse love before it's time. And now she says, awake, and she wants it. There's a reward here. That's the way it's gone. You'd think the book would end in chapter 4. It's like, this is perfect. And I love that there's a chapter 5. I love that there's a chapter 5 because things go south. Relational conflict, something like this. Uh, This isn't exactly it uh, because they never are with each other in this particular scene that we're going to look at. But it's basically... You know, he's mad, and he's sitting one way, and she's saying, talk to the hand, buddy. If you're talking, I don't want to hear it. You quit, you're yapping, I'm done. And this is what happens. And it's, it's painful. <laughs> we'll see as we go through, it's kind of painful. But it's also encouraging because it's in the Bible, and it talks about it. So that's what we're going to look at today. When you look at this, though, when you look at the issue of relational conflict, when you look at that whole thing, you've got to ask the question, is there a good ROI, right? Is there a good return on my investment? Otherwise, I shouldn't do this. This is stupid. Is the risk able to be come out with enough reward so it's worth it? C.S. Lewis says this masterfully. If you know anything about me, you know I love quoting C.S. Lewis. But this is is just a great one. It's from his book called The Four Loves. And this is a great, great quote. It's uh, pages 120 to 121. All this will be up online by tomorrow. Let me read this to you. It says, he's talking about himself, and he says, I'm a safety first creature. Of all arguments against love, none make so strong an appeal to my nature as careful. This might lead you to suffering. To my nature, my temperament, yes. In other words, he's saying, I agree with that. But not to my conscience. I can't go there with my conscience. Why? When I respond to that appeal, I seem to myself to be a thousand miles away from Christ. If I am sure of anything, I am sure that his teaching was never meant to confirm my congenital preference for safe investments and limited liabilities. That word congenital means you're, you're, in, you're, you're ingrained, the ones you're born with. The ones, I have these natural inclinations to stay away from places where I'm going to get hurt. And he says, that's not where Jesus calls you, to safe investments and limited liabilities. I doubt whether there is anything in me that pleases him less. There is no safe investment. 
To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. What he means by that is this. The only place outside heaven where you can perfect, be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations, which is being perturbed, or things that can really bother you, of love is hell. The absence completely of love. Now, he's saying here's your choices. You can choose to go the self-protective route and say, I I'm not going there. That hurts too bad. And what he's saying is that will ultimately lead to that second paragraph there, the, the, the dark, safe, dark, uh, motionless, airless, and it changes to unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable place where you find out that there's no life there. Or you can give yourself, give yourself to relationships, give yourself, be vulnerable, and you most likely will get hurt. No, what did I just say? You will get hurt. Promise you. But that's the way that Christ calls you. Those are your two choices. Pain or pain. Ready? Go. Okay, that's your choice. Pain without life or pain with life. That's the two choices. And if you're a person that says, I'm going to avoid pain, you're going to think you're going to go this way. And the reality is, 5, 10, 15, 30, 50 years from now, you're going to say, how did I end up being a bitter old person? That's what's going to happen. If you go this way and you let those relational conflicts lead you to places where only Christ can heal you from them, you'll go to the way of life. But it's a painful road. They're both painful. There's, the myth is that it's safe completely. With that said, let's go through this. What I want to do today, instead of reading it all throughout, the, you know, read it one time through, I just gonna, it's, a, it's basically a drama that unfolds. And as we go along, I'm just going to make some exclamations. And then what I'm going to do tonight is I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes or so in the passage. Then I'm going to look at this and say, what's actually going on underneath the surface here? What caused all this problem? And then I want to go... One more layer underneath. Peel back the layer of the onions. Okay, donkey? <laughs> guys are not, yeah, okay. I thought, I don't speak your young people language. All right, so. <laughs> if it were me, donkey, you'd be dead. Okay, here we go. Song of Solomon starting in 5, verse 2. This is what I call the request. All right? I slept, but my heart was, a, was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. So stop there just for a second. I'll, let's just talk about this. What does this mean? I slept, but my heart was awake. Here's what it means. I don't know. I really don't. There, there's basically three, three big interpretations that the variety of people who've studied this come up with, that this is a dream, similar to the dream we saw in chapter 3. Okay, where she has this dream where she's out looking for him and all that kind of thing. And that seems pretty clearly a dream. This one could be a dream. And you're going to see some places where it just gets weird. You know, where like dreams get weird, and then it, but it makes sense. Like you turn into an alligator, but that made sense in the dream. Then you wake up and go, that makes no sense. But it was, it was fine in the dream. So she's not going to turn into an alligator, but there's going to be some stuff that's like, this doesn't really flow. So it could be a dream. Second one, it could have actually happened this way. And she's just talking about it. It, it. it could be. It could be. And it could be that the whole thing's just symbolic. All right? So, and it, it means, and boy, I tell you, people take all kinds. When you take that route, you can get all kinds of wild stuff. What I'm basically going to do is this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it as if it's happening. I don't know if whether it happened or not, though. If it didn't, it's poetry, for crying out loud. I, I have no idea. But I'm going to look at it, just taking it at face value. And saying, what would you, how would you feel if you were here? What's going on as if you were there? Okay? That's where we're going to start. And then we're going to kind of go on. What's, what's the principles that we're learning from this? So it kind of fits in all the camps. It could be a dream. could be symbolic. could have actually happened. But what, what is this song trying to teach us about this? 
That's where I'm going to kind of go with it. So now let's follow the story. Here's the story. First part is, listen, my lover is knocking. All right? So she's inside. He's outside. You can see that in the next passage, what he's going to say to her. He is uh, uh, knocking because he can't get in. Okay, now that's weird. He's the king. You'd think you'd have a key, all right, you know, or something. It's just a little, okay, we're probably already in dreamland here or whatever. It gets a little weird already. And here's what he says as he's outside the door, right? So he's talking through the door, and he says this. He says, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. Now remember those four things that he calls her. I'm going to come back to that later. My sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. And he says this, my head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of night. Okay, so what's going on? It, he's been out most of the night. What's he doing? Uh, we don't know, but he's out. He's not with her. He's been out all night. He's playing poker with the guys, smoking cigars. I don't know what he's doing. He's been out all night, and he hasn't been with her. She comes home late and says, oh, I don't have my key. Or, I, don't, I don't know, but he knocks on the door, and he says, open to me. Now, we're going to see that this is actually a sexual advance, all right? He's making a sexual advance, or we'll see this in just a little bit, but has way more, it's way more important than just the sexual advance here. What's going on? But he's been out all night, and he's now coming home saying, how you doing? Open the door. Look at how she responds. This is beautiful. She, she says, no, I'm not going to open the door, inserted by me. I've taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? So the distance from wherever the bedroom is to the door is enough where she says, dude, she's making excuses here, right? She, <laughs> and I don't know if the headache hadn't been invented yet or what, but she just says, she says, uh, I, <laughs> she says, I already took off my robe. Boy, it's a lot of work to put a robe back on. <laughs> to go from this distance to there, because I'll get a little cold. And also, what people in that culture would do, they wear sandals. And so at night, they'd really clean their feet well, so they wouldn't get the bed all, you know, full of sand or different things. And so your feet would be very clean to go to bed. But he's not asking her to walk across the city. She's asking her to walk from her bedroom to the door. But she says, I'll get my feet dirty. Okay, it's the best you can think of at the moment. But, but what, there's something going on below this. She's saying, you, you've been out all night? You've been out all night? It's the middle of the night. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what's going on. And now you knock on the door? Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Not going to happen. Okay, that's what she's saying. So what does he do about it? He makes a demand now. He says, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. So he now takes step into his own hands. He, like, puts his hand where the latch would be, and it's, it's kind of confusing. It's, we don't know exactly how it worked, but they say that there was a, a, an area where you could put some sort of a key into an opening or a, a lock. And sometimes the keys were, like, two feet long, so I hate to have a whole key chain of that. But you have this, and he could have, but he didn't have the key, and so he, he's trying to force his way in now. She's not going to let him in, but he's going to force his way in. Now, that's interesting, because remember what he just got done saying at the wedding night. Now, some time has elapsed, obviously. He's not calling her uh, the bride, any, or her his bride. He's still calling his my sister, and we'll look at that in just a second. But the, the, uh, the thing here is, in the previous chapter, see how well you're paying attention. What did, he, what did he call her in the last chapter? She is a garden, and what kind of garden? Anybody? Locked up. You're a garden locked up. And who has the key for that garden? Her. She has the key. He doesn't get a key. In other words, she's able to self-disclose. She's able to give of herself, both physically and sexually, but way more than that, of all who she is, she's able to give that or not. And what's he trying to do here? He's trying to jimmy the lock. He's trying to get in. He's demanding. Now, this next thing is kind of weird. This, my heart began to pound for him. And if you have a Bible in front of you, you'll see there's a footnote there, and it's really a hard-to-translate thing. It really means something like, my bowels started to shake. Okay? <laughs> How do you translate that? I don't, 
when my bowels shake, I, that means something totally different than what's going on here. So I don't, <laughs> but there's, <laughs> it has that indication of, it could be indignation, indigestion, or, or it could, it, she's not like turned on by this. I think the ESV even says, my heart was thrilled, and that would lead you towards the way, like she's accepting of it. It, it has more of a feeling of, I, I, I'm more upset by this. You know, it makes my, turns my stomach into knots. My, my heart is pounding in a way, maybe not for a positive way, all right? As he's demanding. We keep going on in the story. She changed her mind. She says, I rose to open for my lover. So some time passes in between there. She now says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the door. And my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. So on the handles of a lock, this was a tradition they had. They put myrrh, it was a, 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 a spice, a, a, a perfume. And, and so anybody who touched it, would, their hands would smell that way as well. And it was a festival, it was a party. He wanted a party. That's what's going on. And she says, I now get what he was after. This is what he was after. And that's what's going on. And then she says, I opened for my lover, and now the opportunity's lost. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. So what does Solomon do? He first asks. She says, no. He then puts his hand there, can't jimmy the lock. So he goes, and he goes to being like a four-year-old, and he pouts, and he goes away. So far away, she says, my heart sank at his departure. I can't believe you did that. I can't, I can't believe you left. You're actually leaving over this? And he's gone. She says, I looked for him but didn't find him. She's in calls out for him, but he didn't answer. In other words, he's so far away that when she calls, he can't hear. Or maybe even worse, he's hiding. And she, he hears her but doesn't say anything. This is... This is our beautiful love story, okay? That we've reduced it down to three or six-year-olds. It is that ridiculous, the kind of conflict that they're going through. She then goes out looking for him, and she meets these guys. They're allegedly watchmen, and this is a part where it gets weird too, okay? So here we go into, here it says, the watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Now, watchmen... There's two main things that they were. They were to watch and they were to be men. Well, I mean, they could be people. Watch people. So, and, but the basic idea was they were to protect. So they found her, which you think would be a good thing, right? Well, look what they do. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak. Those, and now she's sarcastic here, watchmen of the walls. They're supposed to be there, protect her. And they're not protecting at all. In fact, they're now injuring. So Solomon, when he leaves, puts her at risk. Physical risk. Now I know, this is where it gets fan fancy. Really, the queen of the region is Solomon's bride. The queen of the region is actually going to get beaten by watchmen. That's where it gets a little weird. But just, it's poetry, all right? Let it go. Just let it go. She's trying to tell us something here. It might be symbolic. Somehow she feels completely unsafe now. In fact, you remember the contrast to when he uh, said we'd come back to this? When he brings that carriage, go to that uh, Song of Solomon chapter 3, 7 and 8. It, it says, look, here comes this carriage escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel. All of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for what? The terrors of the night. Where is she now? She's out looking for him in the middle of the night, in the terrors of the night. Where are the 60 dudes? They're off with Solomon. Solomon is no longer protecting her. Wow. This is crazy what's going on. And that's how she feels. She feels completely vulnerable once again. So then she sees the daughters of Jerusalem. She gives them a plea. She says, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, what will you tell him? Tell him that I'm faint with love. Tell him that I'm lovesick. Tell him that I'm brokenhearted that he would do this. Tell him that I love him and I want him, even though he's acting like a six-year-old, all right? Now, for the first time in the book, we meet these friends, right? We've met these friends many times before. We meet these friends now, 
And this time, for the first time, they're going to put doubt in her mind. They never have before. They've always been encouraging, go for it, go for it, go for it. And this time they're going to say something different. You know what they're going to say? Is this clown worth it? That's what they're going to say to her. Look at what they say. How is your beloved better than others? Most beautiful of women, how is your beloved better than others that you charge us so? They're actually putting doubt in her mind. And she now goes into this description of him in the song. And again, it's poetry. She goes with this description of him telling, is he worth it? Yes, he's worth it. And she's going to use this description. Just like Solomon did to her on the wedding night, starting from the, from the top of her head and moving way down, she's going to do the same thing. But this is different. On the wedding night, there's all this anticipation. There's all this joy of covenant. There's all this wonderful thing about being together. This time, it's just the opposite. It's, yes, there was this joy of being together, and now there's actually sorrow because at this moment, at least, their relationship is broken. It's about love lost, or at least love not the way it's supposed to be. And as she's describing him, you can almost hear like tears coming out her eyes because she's, she's mourning that she's lost this. Look at what she says. My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is purest gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. He's got huge pipes. He's, the gun show is on, you know. He's massive rods of gold. His body is like polished ivory decorated as sapphire, so he's chiseled. He's got a six-pack, similar to this. <laughs> that, that wasn't supposed to be funny. Okay. Uh, <laughs> his legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold, so it's this, this idea of strength. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. So, and the cedars of Lebanon are known throughout Scripture as this beautiful, majestic, honoring thing, you'd look at them, they smelled great, and they were, they, they, they uh, gave comfort because of their strength and their size and whole thing, and he was like that, he was like a rock. It's not of the way he's acting right now, but at this time, this is how she remembers him. His mouth is, is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem, and he's gone. There you go. That's the passage. <laughs> That's in the Bible. That's part of this beautiful love story. It is messed up. It is messed up. So what I want to do for the next, I want to take, I want to take a look at two more layers underneath this. This first layer I want to look at is what happened? How did this, how did this get here? What, what, what caused them to act like this, especially him? What caused him to be like that? And I'm convinced that what it was, and I think as we go through this, I'll show you, Five ways that both of them, most, I think four to five are from him, ways to act like a selfish pig. Because that's what the ultimate problem here is. He is a complete selfish pig. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you get the graphic there? Selfish pig? Selfish? Huh. Oh, okay. I'm not going to waste my good stuff on you guys anymore. Um, <laughs> I hate puns. I don't know why I did this one. All right. But the concept here is what's, what's ultimately riding underneath this. Okay, there's this behavior up top. You got to ask why did that happen? And ultimately, the layer underneath is selfishness. Incredible selfishness. So what I want to give you right now, just kind of making a couple observations on the passage, is five ways to be a selfish pig from this passage. Number one. Concern yourself primarily with your own desires, your own needs, way above everybody else's. Okay? Always. Here's the concept. If you remember from last week, we talked about uh, your passions, your needs, your desires being like a dog. And most of the time, you need to take that dog, put him on a leash, okay, and take him for a walk and make sure that they don't get off the leash. There's appropriate places and times, and we looked at last night in the sexual area, 
as to unleash that in a certain confined area. Marriage is this con certain confined, fenced-in area where you unleash the dog and you let him run. That's the way some of us live our entire lives. We live as if everything is an off-leash area. And I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and don't get in my way. Everything is off-leash. I'm just going to let it run. And if you've been around people like this, it's just really annoying because they're just always what they want. And it's just their desires, whatever they want. And that's what's going on with him, right? What does he do? He's been out all night, and yet, what does he say to her? Hey, baby, hey, baby, open the door. Open the door. And he's saying, this is what I want. That's the first thing. Let your own desires, don't ever put them on a leash. Second thing, way to be a selfish pig, is be manipulative, okay? Be manipulative. What does he say to her? <laughs> Remember I said, look at those four things that he says to her. <laughs> hey, baby, I'm out here. And what does he call her? He says, he says, open the door. And he says this, my sister, remember what that implies from last week. That implies, hey, we made a covenant. We're now married. We're in the same family. You, you owe me this. My darling, my dove, my flawless one, my pookie bear, whatever you're going to say. That one's added by me. But... This concept of being manipulative. In other words, I'm going to say something, I'm going to do something to get you to do something. I'm actually just trying to manipulate you or use you in such a way. Oftentimes, your speech is like that. You look at someone and you say, oh, man, that's a nice shirt. What you really want them to do is say, you have a nice shirt. <laughs> right? That's what you're doing. Sometimes you'll say this with people that you love. You'll say, oh, I love you. And then there's no response. Sometimes when I feel that coming uh, in high school, uh, and, and, and I just wouldn't say anything. And then it'd be the follow-up. I love you. Mmm. You're not really saying I love you. You're saying a statement which says, say to me I love you or I'm going to beat you to a pulp. That's what it's saying. <laughs> okay, then that's not really love because I'm not... Just shut up and say it, okay? So, but that's manipulation. We're all masters of it. If you don't think you manipulate, you're, 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 you're not listening to yourself at times. We all want people to like us and we'll do things to get things from others or whatever. How to be a selfish pig? Be incredibly manipulative. Third way to be a selfish pig is use indirect speech. Don't be assertive in saying what you really want. Instead, be be somewhat manipulative, but use indirect speech. She does this. She, instead of saying, listen, clown, you were out all night. You didn't care at all about what was going on with me. I've been fuming in this bed all night long. Now, I have no idea if that's what's going on, but it's poetry. I get to have my own sanctified imagination. I'm mad at you for being gone all night and then coming in and saying, hey, how you doing? Let's, let's get it on. Here we go. And he's like, What? You, what do you, she doesn't say that. She says this. You know, my robe. I, I, gotta have a, I, I have to get a robe. And I'd have to get, I'd have to, my feet would get dirty. This indirect speech thing. I grew up in a family uh, in, in Minnesota. In, in Minnesota, what we call indirect speech is called talking. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's the way we do this, right? You don't ever say anything straight. You say it a little bit. And we have, we have people move here from the East Coast or from Chicago and they, can, they think we're the weirdest thing because we don't ever say anything. Somebody's wearing something that's just bizarre. We don't say, man, that's really bizarre. We say, that's interesting, <laughs> right? We, we do. We don't say it straight. My dad used to say this one. I love this one. He, uh, we'd be all eating, and it was just the three of us, and he'd look at me and say, well, while you're up, get the milk. And I'd say, uh, I, I'm not up. And he says, well, you are going to be when you go get the milk. All right, so... <laughs> Now, I appreciate the second part. At least he explained it. You know, and it's the old phrase, you know, gosh, the garbage is full. Wouldn't it be great if somebody took out the garbage? I, I love that because I don't fall for it. I always say things like, yeah, that would be great. And I keep walking because I can't stand indirect speech. It drives me crazy. It's just like, if you want me to do something, just ask me. But don't use this indirect speech thing. And the way to be a selfish pig is to not 
ever come out and actually give your expectation or your, your feelings, but it's instead just to lay this stuff out there and think that people will pick up the hint. Now, since it's Mother's Day, maybe this is an okay day to say this. Maybe not. But if it's not, just drop me an email at seth at hopecc.com. That'll be fine. <laughs> the, um, I think oftentimes uh, the, the women of the species, they often think that men understand and pick up hints on certain things. Let me just encourage you something, ladies. We don't have that chip. That chip just doesn't exist. Whatever chip it means to observe something and to notice it, just wasn't given to us. Huh? What? I don't know what you're talking about. And it's not because we're dumb. We just are stupid. <laughs> just don't have it. And we don't see it. So if you want to go to a certain restaurant, what I need to hear is, I want to go to this restaurant. Oh, okay. Got it. I can handle that. But wouldn't it be nice if we went to somewhere Italian? Well, there's like 3,000 Italian places. Well, you'll figure it out. No, no, I won't. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't. Use direct speech. You want to be a selfish pig? Don't use an indirect. Use indirect speech. Fourth way. I love this picture. Um, uh, <laughs> when you don't get your way, pout, withdraw, and give the ever infamous silent treatment. Right? No, I'm not mad. I'm not mad at all. Really? No. So everything's fine then? Yeah. <laughs> right. <clears throat> what happens in the story? She goes to the door. She changes her mind. He withdraws. He withdraws completely from the situation and runs away. He's gone. He says, enough. I don't get my way. We go, yep, go, go when we're out, take my ball, go home. Turns into a six-year-old and goes away. By the way, that's the, that's the very thing that uh, if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, and it talks about husbands love your wives. How? It says, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So people say, well, is the husband then the leader in the home? Yes, he's the leader in the home in this regard. Not that he gets all his preferences, in fact, Jesus didn't get his preferences. His preference was not to go to the cross. Father, if it's your will, could this cup be taken from me? It wasn't his preference. He gave up his preference for us. You get to be the leader in the sense that you move towards. You be a man of courage and step into her life. And it's scary there. I know I'm married to one. You women are scary. I don't mean anything against you. It's just, you're scary. Because it's hard to understand another person, let alone someone of another gender. And it's like, wow, this is a mystery. I don't understand it. And even get down there in the, you know, the deeper levels, down the sixth level basement area of her life. It's like, I don't even understand that she'll say, and I'm like, great. That's both of us. Now I'm frightened and spitless. If you don't know what you're doing, and I'm down here too, and then we could barely got a flashlight with one battery and, Anyway, that's another analogy. But you get the idea. It's scary. And we're called to be men of courage to step into their lives. And that's not what happens. What we do is withdraw. Men, we are notorious for withdrawing. We check out. We become masters of things that are safe. We go do television because the television has never yelled at me and said, you're a bad television watcher. Right? Right? I'm a great television watcher. All my life, the television has done nothing but affirm me. You're great. Keep doing it. I can go and do that because it's safe. And I withdraw from relationships because they're scary. And that's exactly what Solomon does here. I don't get my way. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to leave you. And I don't want to be around you. All right? Because we're afraid of failure. So it's going on here. He failed in what he was trying to get. He was failing in this relationship. So I'm out of here. And if you look at what's going on in our culture right now, it is by people who have just decided, I'm out of this relationship. I'm checking out. I'll go somewhere else. And they just keep bouncing from relationship to relationship to relationship instead of saying, I'm in this sucker. We're going to work this thing out. 
It scares me spitless. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to be a woman of courage. I'm going to stick it out. He doesn't do that. Way to be a selfish pig is as soon as the going gets tough, scram, pow, withdraw. And the last way, five, is because of that, he then turns into a complete coward. And he fails to champion her. He fails to protect her. He fails in all these, the watchmen are, remember in the story, the watchmen are able to beat her and to take her cloak. And he doesn't even care. Well, that's what you get. You know, you, that's what you deserve. I, I, you know, you didn't open the door. So if you'd opened the door, everything would have been fine. It's like, really? Really? And so he then falls into this thing where it's all about him. He withdraws his resources. He withdraws, withdraws his love. He withdraws completely. That's what's going on. You want to be a selfish pig? Do those things. Now, <laughs> you're like, really? That's the message? Tell me how to be a selfish pig? That's, that's beautiful. So you might be thinking, you might be thinking, probably what he wants me to do is to not do those things. That's where I cannot be a selfish pig, right? By not doing the things that he just said to do, then I won't be a selfish pig. And the reality is, no. So what I want to do now is look at the level below that. So we, first we have the story. Then underneath that, we have what's going on. It's selfishness, mostly on his part. Four of the five things are about him. But beneath that, what's fueling the selfishness? What's actually fueling the selfishness? And here's the deal. You're in a church right now. This is a Christian church. The answer always is the same. If you're in a Christian church, the answer to every problem is Jesus. Every problem, the gospel, is the answer. Now, how do you pull the gospel through this one? How do you make the gospel the answer to this incredible issue of selfishness? In other words, how, how do I kill this idol that's going on in my life? What's the idolatry that's beneath this? All right, go to the next one, Chris. What's the idolatry that's going on beneath? Why am I worshiping self? That's what's beneath it. Because you'll never, listen, you can't just reach in, the, in your pocket in the morning, oh yeah, don't be a selfish pig today. Great, okay, good, I'm good. That's not going to happen. You and I are by nature selfish pigs. Let me just say this. <laughs> Yesterday, I'm working on this sermon on being a selfish pig. The phone rings. It's Carol. She says, hey, I've been out running around. I picked up. Calvin out in Woodbury, and I got to go to Lakeville and get David, came back from college, then I got to go to Sam's Club and get all this stuff. Would you mind snapping the beans for tonight for dinner and cooking them? And I'm like, oh, come on. Are you serious? I finally got going on this. I'm not kidding you. It's like she's been running around all day. She asks me to do three-minute task. And I said, oh, really? Honey, come on. I just am working on this. And I hang up the phone, and I just thought, oh, my gosh. Go snap the freaking beans. <laughs> so I just got up, and I did it, and goodness sakes. But you and I, by nature, are selfish pigs. If, if you're not married yet, let me just encourage you. The one thing that you will find out for sure when you get married, you are a selfish pig. Marriage will be like a mirror where you'd never seen it before. I'm an only child. I didn't even have to share my bedroom or any of my toys. If I didn't like the neighbor kids, I told them to go home. I was, they were, there was none of this. He's touching me. He's, well, I did that, but then they kind of look at me weird like, what's that about in the back seat? There's only one there. But uh, <laughs> when, when I got married, I realized, oh, my gosh, do I want my preferences all the time? How do you kill that? How do you kill that idolatry of self? Here's how I think it happens. Here's what the problem is. It's a picture of the solar system. There we go. There's the sun, and there are nine planets. Yes, Pluto is a planet, all right? Can I get an amen on that, huh? All right, all in favor, say aye. Aye, Pluto's a planet. Anything you heard other than that, wrong. Pluto is a planet. It's a dot. See the dot, little one? It's a planet. Now, anyway, sorry, <clears throat> a little rant there. Um, Pastor has issues. Yes, he does. But this one's not on anger management. This one's on selfishness, so I'm working on it. All right. Pluto and all the other planets, they revolve around the sun, right? And when Copernicus figured this out, 
instead of the earth being the center of the universe or, or the galaxy as they thought of it at that time, they realized something. Oh my goodness, the, everything doesn't revolve around the earth. Everything revolves around the sun. And we're the third planet there from the sun. And we revolve around the sun as well. And I think what happens to us every day is we wake up and it looks like this. It looks like us. That's a picture of me in 2005. Uh, yeah, that is kind of cool hair. The, uh, uh, is, is we put ourselves in the sun. Why do you do that? Why do you put yourself as the center of the universe? Well, it's really quite simple why we do that. Why you naturally do that. Why? Because my consciousness always rides with me. Right? Your consciousness doesn't ride. I don't, I don't wake up and say, oh, wow, Lindsay's toe hurts. I don't think that way because it's Lindsay's toe and if she stubbed it or whatever, Lindsay's thinking about that. My consciousness is with me all day long. I live up here 24-7. It's a scary place to live up here. I'm just saying, okay? But you live up there except in you the same. And you are you and I am me. And because of that, we have a natural... <laughs> This all makes sense to me right now. I'm hoping this is working for you. But we have this natural thing where the only thing I think about is what's going on with me. Because no one else is taking care of me, so I better take care of me. I wake up in the morning and my back hurts. I got back problems. Back hurt a little bit. And it's like, oh, somebody else didn't say, ow. I say, ow. Right? So naturally, I put myself at the center of my existence. It's what happens naturally. And when you go that the way through life, you become a selfish pig because it's not the way you're designed. You're not designed to be the center. How do you kill it? You can't kill it by saying, don't do it. You have to kill it by putting the sun back where it belongs. Proverbs 1 7 says this it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. What belongs in the center? A view of God that is so big and so awesome, and Jesus Christ, where he belongs, is high and exalted, that he is who he is. You take yourself off the throne, and you put Jesus there. And when that happens, and only that way, when you get so infatuated and so preoccupied with who God is, that you can lose yourself and say, oh yeah, I'm a planet. I revolve around that, not the other way around. Let me share with you real briefly how this happened in one person in the Old Testament. His name was Isaiah. He's just a normal guy, and something happens to him, and it becomes for him a Copernican revolution. Everything now revolves around this sun, and the sun is the fear of the Lord. The sun, S-U-N, is this idea that God is that majestic and that holy. Look at what this says. It's, it's what people call the calling of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. So he has this vision of God, and he's seated on a big throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple. So it's this image that he has, this vision of God in the temple. It's just his train fills the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts shook, and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. What happens to Isaiah? He gets an image of God that blows his mind. Whatever image of God is in your mind, way too small. Way too small. God is an infinite, powerful, majestic, holy Perfect, all great, and all good God. And he gets a glimpse of that. And then what happens? He's no longer the center. In fact, he realizes that he's in trouble. And he says to himself, look at the distance between me and God. It's amazing. Woe to me. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. He just picks one of his sins. He's got a potty mouth. And he picks that sin. And he's now all consumed realizing that there's this difference. He's no longer looking at himself and says, hey, look at me. These are my preferences. He's saying, I'm a sinner before this holy, majestic, 
awesome God. And then what? look what happens. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. The altars where sacrifice was made. The sacrifices in the temple were a foreshadowing. That's all they were. It's just a foreshadowing of this, of the cross, of Jesus Christ. That could take away your sins. The infinite one given for you took the wrath of God so you wouldn't have to. For anyone who trusts him and believes, that is your sin substitute. And it's talked about right here in Isaiah. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this is atoned, or this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And now Isaiah stops being a selfish pig, and he starts to live for others. Because then it says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will go out for us? And who, whom shall I send, and who will go out for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. That's how you overcome being a selfish pig. When you are set and your mind is put upon the greatness of God, you lose yourself. You don't, you don't, you're not thinking about you anymore. It's not about you. And even though everything's going to want to pull you every day into being a selfish pig in all of your relationships, in all of your life, you realize it's about something greater. It's about God. And I fall at my feet and I worship him. That's what happens. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must what? Deny himself. Take yourself off the throne. Can't be on the throne. There's only room for one God in your life, and it's not you. It's not me. He must deny himself. Take up his cross. Die to yourself. And then follow me. Be consumed with me. Be after me. Your eyes are set on something greater. For, and here's what he says. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever want, loses his life, for me, will find it. The ironic thing is, if you think, I'll just be self-protective. I'll keep myself on the throne. I'll live that way. Jesus says here, that will lead you to, ultimately, a ruined life. You will lose it. Same thing C.S. Lewis said. If you think you can go and keep yourself in self-protection, you won't. It'll lead towards pain and lead towards bitterness lead toward becoming someone you don't want to become. But whoever loses his life and says, I'm willing to get off the throne, I'm willing to go over here, and Jesus, I want to put you there, you, you will find your life, and you'll have real life. Okay, with all that said, brought up a lot of stuff tonight. Let's pause right here just for a second and see if anybody's got any questions whatsoever about anything at all relatively germane to what we're talking about here. And uh, if you have relational conflict with someone in the room, maybe we don't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, anything you want to ask questions about. In other words, wh the question was, what would have been a proper way or a right way for him to have dealt with this situation? And, and part of that I'm reading, it's poetry, okay? So they don't tell me. Everything. That's a good question. So first of all, maybe don't be out all night. <laughs> you know, that probably was part of the problem. And then, and then if, it, if it was a problem, or maybe she had false expectations, again, we don't know. It's in the white space. So I don't know what's going on here. But somehow she's not happy with him because he comes home late at night. And so that's the first problem. There was expectations on either one of them that wasn't met. But he shouldn't just come in thinking, oh, this is, everything's fine. So the first thing would be something like, I know I've been out all night, and you're probably pretty hurt by that. And then she could say let me just speak frankly here. Not with the goal that I, I'm going to do all this because I want to have sex. Okay? Okay, I'll do whatever you want. That's just manipulation again. Okay, I'm going to, okay, how do you feel about this? Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Good, 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 good. And, uh, and uh, uh, how was your day? Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, so that's just manipulation too. Okay, so those of you who are married, that's, you can just use that in the same way. It can just become manipulation because what you're after sex. By the way, make, it, make your goal, not sex. Make your goal oneness. That's helped me and Carol and our relationship. The goal is oneness. The fruit of that is good sex. But oneness, I, I really want to know you. I don't want just this experience. I want oneness with you the way God designed it. So I don't know exactly, but it was destroyed the minute he knocks on that door and starts calling her, hey, baby, open the door, honey. Everything's going to, you know, let's party. I got myrrh on the handle. Here we go. Giddy up, you know. So nobody has relational conflict. Ha, ha, ha.
Yeah, I'll start picking you off one by one and telling you about it. No. (laughs) Well, good. Well, let me close then today with this. Let me close with this and ask you this. Are are you, the question I want to close with you and have you ponder as we close with a couple songs of response and as we come to the table, communion table tonight is this. Are, Are you willing, are you ready to get yourself off the throne? And I'm not talking about a one-time decision. I'm, this is a daily decision. You slip automatically right back into selfish pig land. I'm not asking you if five years ago you made a commitment to Jesus. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you right now, right here, who's on the throne? Is Jesus Christ on the throne? Or are you on the throne and Jesus is kind of in the, in the room? Who's on the throne tonight? Let's pray together.